So this is a quick video about the INEOS Fusilier. We're going to look at everything we know about it and what conclusions we can draw, but we're going to start with a quote by Sir Jim. Now what Sir Jim has said is probably the most important statement in road safety for quite a while for vehicles and it is this. I can't stand going through three layers of menus to put the seat heaters on. This is a bit tangential, tangential to the Fusilier but it's so important because I think the biggest road safety issue with modern cars is usability and exactly that. So I thought the guy needs a knighthood so I thought actually he's already got one so we're just going to call him Sir Sir Jim and hopefully he won't say too much more because three sirs will be a lot. But let's take a look at the EV architecture then because the Fusilier is built on a ground up new platform. Now this isn't it but it's an example of the skateboard architecture common in EVs and also with the Fusilier. Essentially that means you've got a large battery pack low and centre central and quite flat and you've got your motor at, and the suspension unit at the back and one at the front. This is a rear wheel drive example. Um, here's an example from Atlas, same sort of concept um, and this is the Tesla Cybertruck again you can see battery in the center drivetrain at the back motor there motor there and it's it's uh, linked by software this is a tri-motor design this is the rear two motors one at one at the front but the basic skateboard concept is the same all the way through so what does this actually mean now I've got a video where I talk about EV powertrains and their pros and cons um, off-road but quick recap CWD is is combined wheel drive. You've got one motor here I've represented in blue, driving a transfer case, front diff, rear drift, it's just one power source. And that's what we use in all petrol and diesel vehicles, or pretty much all of them. Then we've got IWD or individual wheel drive here. We've got a electric um, a battery, which I've represented in purple. And then in blue, there's the uh, motors at each wheel. So you've got four motors for each wheel, which sounds great, and it is, but there's pros and cons of that. Again, I've explored that in another video. You've got your single motor design, not applicable for off-roading. Dual motor, which is when, again, we've got the battery here, motor at the front, motor at the rear, or twin motor sometimes. It's generally not twin because typically the battery, the motor at the back should be bigger than the one at the front, certainly for off-roading because you're going to be going up, up hills. Um, and you've got a tri-motor design, which is a combination of the two. So you've got a single motor at the front and one's at the rear. Now, any of us have gone, um, we do know this for the twin or really sort of dual motor design. Um, it will be all wheel drive and uh, diff at the front, diff at the rear, one battery driving both motors with a software four wheel drive lock. And I don't know if they're going to put the cross axle locks in. I would hope so because um, they haven't done a great job of brake traction control. So let's hope that they've done that. Now, there is a massive risk with electric vehicle four-wheel drives, and I really hope INEOS are going to get on top of this. I've explained it all fully in the other video, but just briefly, on a hill, you've got a lot of braking force going to the front wheel, just that's the way cars naturally brake, but very little grip. And what that can mean is that if the centre diff is in effect unlocked, the car can slide down the hill. So we've got brake bias to the front wheel, limited weight and grip on the front wheel, centre diff unlocked. Remember this is now a software center differential, not a mechanical one. It has to be a software differential because there's no linkage from rear to front diff. If that's unlocked the car can just slide down the hill helplessly and then you are in really big trouble. Uh, front wheels rotate, rears, um, front wheels locked, rears rotate, car slides down the hill. So this is actually a significant safety alert for four-wheel driving and I really hope the software engineers at INEOS and everyone else who's making electric four-wheel drives really understand the dangers involved in driving these vehicles on hills and work through the necessary programming to ensure that the vehicles are capable and more importantly safe on hills because so far I have not seen very much evidence of it at all and I don't honestly have a lot of faith in in the vehicle manufacturers to do this, but let's hope. Now the Fusilier does have fully independent suspension and I can see you go, oh my God, it's gonna be less capable off-road. Well, no, it's not, not necessarily. And you only need to look at the Land Rover product specifically. And if you want to, my L663 test versus the Grenadier LC300 and Patrol and the L663 was in no way disgraced. Land Rovers are really capable off-road and they're now fully independent suspension. However, the caveat is, 
if the electronics are good, you have to have really good electronic engineering to make independent suspension the equivalent of live axles off-road. And so far, Ineos have not demonstrated much capability in that. First of all, their brake traction control is very, very ordinary compared to the other vehicles. Secondly, they've done things like disable it on the front axle when you've got the rear locker engaged. You can't um, engage uh, hill descent control when you've got a rear cross axle locker engaged, etc. The list goes on. So I really hope Ineos up their game with the electronics and make this as capable as it potentially um, could be. It's also unlikely in my view to have low range, but um, you never know. Uh, and I don't necessarily think it would actually need it either, but again, we don't know till we really drive it. Um, ground clearance should be better because it's independent suspension, but you can see it doesn't really look that great here because I haven't angled it, um, angled those uh, control arms up, but um, we can live in hope for that. Um, the on-road handling should be improved as it's fully independent. Um, and yes, there will be a robustness compromise, but it should weigh less comparatively. Now this is something I actually wish they'd done with the Grenadier, which is put fully independent suspension into it, do the electronics properly, and then it would actually weigh less and that would have the advantage of having more payload because the Grenadier is payload compromised. Now this will be heavier because it is an, um, an E V and that will eat into payload. We don't know the figures yet, we'll just have to wait and see. Now, here's the question, where is the spare? I can't see it underneath here, it's certainly not on the back. I don't think it's inside, um, although they did put it in the tub of the Quartermaster U, which is a bizarre decision in, in my view, but that's where it is. Um, so hopefully this thing's got a spare tire and um, if it is inside, that's gonna destroy most of the load space, unfortunately. So it's a shame it couldn't go on the back. What is an EV? And that's actually an interesting question in the context of the Fusilier. So the definition, definition is an electric vehicle is a vehicle which uses electric motors to drive its wheels, which is not the same as a BEV, which is a battery electric vehicle. Come on to that in a second. That's a Tesla Model Y riffing their examples of BEVs. We've also got hybrid vehicles, in this case, series hybrid vehicles, Nissan's X-Trail e-Power um, and the D D Dakar winning uh, Audi. We've also got a range extender and that's one of the options for the Fusilier. So let's take a look at exactly what those three mean. So I've got three identical powertrains at the moment. We're going to add a BEV, a series hybrid and a range extender to each. Now the BEV is simple. The battery is the sole energy source. So we put a massive battery in that vehicle and that provides power for the front motor and the rear motor with our software Defensual lock, proportioning torque, front and rear, as the case um, may be, and hopefully that is got right. A series hybrid is a bit different. So the ice is actually the primary energy source. It's got a small battery and the ice generates electricity directly to the motors as well as charges the battery. So we put a much smaller battery in there, which keeps cost and weight down, but we have a petrol engine or diesel engine, which is pretty much the same size as would be with even without the, the vehicle, uh, without the battery. And that can actually provide electricity directly to the front motor or the rear motor or both at the same time. And it can also charge the battery or sometimes it can do all three at the same time as well. But the battery is very much smaller and you've got a large ice engine. Then we've got a range extender, which is what the Fusilier um, actually is. And here we We've got a medium sized battery, smaller than a BEV, but a lot larger than ICE, and it's about two thirds the capacity, rumours say, um, of, the, of the Fusilier BEV. And we've got a small petrol engine because the only job that has is to charge that main battery as distinct from drive those two. So the advantage here, you can have a much smaller petrol engine and it can also be optimised. In effect, it's a generator, so it can run just at a constant rev, etc. And you're going, oh, hang on, but if you need to put petrol into this, then etc. you know, it's, it's, um, it's, you might as well just drive the wheels. Well, no, because you've then, you don't have any of the complexity of all the drivetrains and transfer cases and etc. Et um, that you would in an ICE vehicle. Also, because this is a generator, it can run really efficient. It can just run at a, a constant 1500 RPM or whatever it is, whereas the, this um, engine here has to run at uh, different RPMs and it can't be optimized, etc. And this is also quite small. So this actually does make sense. Um, and the range extender is what the Fusilier will offer, as well as a BEV. So the EV options then, so we've got the EV or the, or the, or the really the BEV, 
That's said to have around 400 kilometers WLTP range. Now I know from my testing in EVs and everyone else's, you're probably gonna get more like about 280 kilometers realistically um, on the road. Um, aerodynamics, we're gonna talk about that in a second. The range extender is said to have a battery around two thirds, so that would probably be more like 300 WLTP, probably more like about 200 purely electric. But remember, you will have that petrol engine. We don't know the tank size or anything at the moment. Um, but uh, that will almost certainly exceed the range of the EV comfortably, and obviously you can refuel it quickly as well. And apparently they, it was a fairly recent decision to go with the range extender model um, because they somehow suddenly realized EVs don't have great range. So why that was suddenly a last minute decision and surprise is a bit of a shock. But um, anyway, here we are. I'm glad that they're offering both. I think that's a really good idea. Now let's talk about aerodynamics or lack thereof. So this is your typical EV, a Tesla Model Y, beautifully streamlined as you can see. This is the Fusilier, not in the least bit streamlined, which is a good thing because then we get lots of storage space and it's practical and it's boxy. Unfortunately, aerodynamics is where it's at for EVs and that is really gonna compromise the range as will those heavy um, high rolling resistance tires and this, uh, even if they're special EV off-road tires. So that's a problem for um, the vehicle's range for sure. But there is actually an upside and that means because it's already quite draggy, when we do things like towing and adding accessories to it, the proportional drop on range is going to be less than if we added those accessories to something as aerodynamically efficient as the Tesla Model Y. Now, this is a slightly arcane point, but I have explained it fully in my towing versus uh, EV tow test um, video, and that's why EV range drops so dramatically when you tow. It's because they're already so efficient to begin with. Also, we can note here there's a very poor ramp over angle, which is disappointing to see, uh, but we can note that the tyres are all terrains and there is a reasonable um, profile there as well, but the, tire, the wheels don't appear to be aerodynamic, so maybe Maybe it's just a prototype. Maybe they're just going to put um, different tires on it and more aerodynamic wheels and change the body. I, I don't know. Um, but looking at me, I'd, I'd go, you know, even for a practical four wheel drive, I think that's work could be done to make that more aerodynamically efficient. Now, size wise, um, it's been reported as four and a half meters long. The Grenadier itself is 4.855 um, millimeters long but that does include the spare wheel, so it's probably pretty much gonna be around the same size, I feel. So conclusions, what do, what do we know? Well, we know um, Ineos have to do this because that is the way the world is going, whether you like EVs or not, it's a commercial decision, and I'm happy they are. I think that the world needs um, electric vehicles of this nature, so I'm happy to see Ineos doing it um, because few other manufacturers seem to be going in that direction. I just hope they do it right, particularly with the electronics. Um, New EV skateboard architecture ground up, which is good. Uh, short range EV, it has to be. They can't put a massive battery. I suspect the payload will be compromised. The Grenadier is already running into a three and a half ton um, maximum vehicle mass limit. And this isn't gonna help matters. And I think that's why they've gone independent for also the reasons I talked about before. Poor aero, poor range, but less workhorse effect. BEV and RX um, versions, which is good to see. Independent suspension, again, don't get too worried about that. It does actually work off-road and it can be robust. And let's hope they sort the off-road electronics. Um, 26, 27 is when we're gonna see this. We don't know exactly for sure. They've only just um, announced it. I will be tracking progress. I do hope to have a technical interview with Ineos at some point in the future. So in the meantime, I hope you found this useful. Thank you for watching. Any questions, drop them in the comments.